If I can uh, ask everyone to have to, to be seated, and uh, I also want to welcome everyone to uh, our panel, uh, the need for public intellectuals and Trump America strategies for communication, engagement, and advocacy. I should know that it was one of my former PhD students who was the last one to sit down. Uh, thank you, Matt Cook. It's a, it's a very serious uh, mood and a serious time, no doubt, uh, but we have to keep our humor. Uh, I will start off on a humorous note in the sense that there is a lot of people packed up on this stage, and I am very grateful that I've lost weight recently because I, I feel it buckling up under me. So uh, if one of us goes down, the next person in line will fill their space. It's a, it's a good, powerful group here. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to, as I said, welcome you. My name is Derek Alderman. I'm the Vice President of the American Association of Geographers and the incoming President. And uh, uh, in my capacity as Vice President, uh, I quickly organized this session in the immediate wake of the election of President Donald Trump. Um, it's pretty safe to say that even before the inauguration occurred, uh, we were beginning to hear from members from all different quarters, and we were hearing different things from members. We were hearing about the need for AAG as an association to uh, step up and to make statements and to say certain things and to assist in uh, being the voice, particularly for our more vulnerable members. Uh, I also heard from members that were asking us in very sincere ways, what is it that I can do? Uh, what is it that any geographer can do? What is it that any public intellectual can do? So there's larger questions about what is being a public intellectual and what in fact is public intellectualism in geography? What is the history of it and how does it in fact perhaps need to grow? And that are some of the questions that we're addressing today. And then of course we also heard from members who were already uh, operating in a public intellectual manner and already mobilized, already uh, holding teach-ins, already writing op-eds, already organizing community events. And these people have, in fact, uh, I'll be very forthright, have inspired me and have uh, really pushed me to organize this panel well after the AEG deadline. And um, to, to perhaps the consternation of Oscar Larson, who's been a tremendous organizer of this meeting, uh, he's found a great spot for us. And so please, let's give a round of applause for Oscar Larson, the AEG. And in fact, I, I'd like to take a moment, and, and it is important to say, and we'll hear from our panelists soon, and, and I'll sit down. No one's come really to hear me. Um, is that we have folks right here in the audience that I know, and I know many of you very well, who are already doing fantastic things at your own universities and your own communities and already planning in ways and it's not even yet the completion of the 100 days. It only feels like 150 years, uh, but in fact, it's not even quite 100 days. Uh, and I'd like to, to highlight someone who really should probably be up on this panel, but in my rush to try to put this together in such a way and get, and get this on the program was not able to include her, uh, as, as Hilda Kurtz from the University of Georgia. Uh, Hilda, if you don't mind, please stand up and let folks see you. Uh, I, I can tell you that this, this panel is just one and many that will probably be coming down the pike in the future at future meetings. Uh, Hilda is actually a great role model for thinking through some of these issues. She at the University of Georgia, where she serves as a full professor, uh, have organized sort of a first 100 days of action. And she was telling me last night, as I discovered to my horror, uh, how she really should have been on this panel and was not. No offense to my panelists, now they feel like the dog's breakfast. Uh, that uh, that yeah, she's holding teach-ins, she's using social media in savvy ways. And uh, Hilda and I, I think, are the same of opinion that however you reach out, however you engage publicly or politically, uh, it's, it's, it's critical to do it in ways uh, that uh, in fact make sense and that are effective. Uh, and so uh, I also would like to mention that Hilda is a co-editor of the Southeastern Geographer, 
uh, a journal near and dear to my heart. They just published a very nice special issue on black geographies. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to, to, to go online and get that. Uh, yeah, just calm down over there. Uh, you, you can tell that's one of the contributors. You can tell that's one of the contributors to the special issue. No one gets that excited about a journal issue except for someone who... Uh, so let, let, let's get more to the business and, and to the business at hand. Um, as you know, the AAG has, 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 uh, has stepped up to try to respond to many of the controversies and issues that have been uh, arising out of the Trump administration uh, early on. Uh, it is important to realize, and I think Doug Richardson has done a superb job of uh, responding to members as well as the council. Um, and we have, in fact, uh, mobilized a lot of our policy arms our organizational affiliations and our communication networks. There's more work to be done. I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat this. There is more work to be done, and, and the AEG has embraced that, and I'm very proud to be part of that organization. But it is important to realize that no one organization, no matter how well run it is, has the capacity to respond meaningfully to every challenge. And in fact, I would perhaps argue that being uh, basically surviving and sustaining oneself and succeeding in the Trump era will be a multi, where we'll require a multi-pronged, multi-scale approach. It's necessary to complement the actions taken by AG with your own actions as geographers individually and collectively working within your communities, your universities, and your workplaces to affect change. And it's got to be everybody involved, all hands on deck, as they say. Uh, yet many of us, and this includes me, Many of us are not trained to move outside of the academy or our industry circles. We've not been trained to engage with communities or policymakers or elected officials and the media. For me personally, I never took a course, a college course, on how to be a public intellectual. I had great mentors and advisors, uh, and they have served me well, but they seldom taught me or seldom talked about uh, public outreach. And so many of us have a passion for this, we believe in it, but we are not necessarily trained in it. And what I've tried to do today is bring forward on this panel some voices who can really speak through their own experiences uh, to the urgent need for more public intellectuals in geography, along with perhaps the opportunities and challenges that that presents. Um, the panelists have also been asked, because I'm a grounded kind of guy, I'm the, where the rubber hits the road, uh, everyone's supposed to say, that's great. Uh, it's a tough crowd. Uh, but I'm very much interested in keeping this grounded so we can talk intellectually and theoretically, but we also want to make sure that we have specific suggestions, strategies, practical advice. So I will say that uh, I was very tough on these panelists. Hilda, maybe it's better that you were not involved. It, more work for you. And many of them have actually pr uh, prepared handouts of some tips and some practical advice and publications that you might find interesting. There's probably not enough to go around with this great crowd, and I apologize for that, but feel free to uh, um, uh, approach panelists to, to get information, because uh, we do want this to, to, to move on to not just be a one-time thing, but for this to be a tradition of holding panels that talk about public intellectualism and unlike me, who did not have a college course in being a public intellectual, we need to start having required curriculum, whether it's at these meetings or whether it's in our college classrooms or our public school classrooms, about what, in fact, it means to be a public intellectual and, and how can geographers leverage uh, their strengths and their passions to affect change. I, I will say, in, in, in closing, before we have a panelist come up, that uh, even though this seems to be all quite new, it all seems to be quite in response and perhaps reaction to recent political events and uh, what Doug Richardson has described as turbulent times. I will say, and, and I encourage you to look this up, that uh, uh, public outreach and engagement is one of the core recommendations of the AEG long-term plan. So AEG developed a long-term plan. It goes from 2015 to, two, to 2025, and in fact, outreach and engagement is part of that. It's interesting because I reread it last night and getting my remarks together, and it was interesting that the job of AEG, and hence I think this panel is very appropriate, 
The job of AEG is to help prepare and train its members to make interventions in large-scale public debates about science, policy, and public understanding. And that, in fact, uh, this is exactly the kind of thing, to be quite critical, that we should have been doing a long time ago. We will need to continue doing well past Trump because the sustainability and the success of our discipline and the success of your ideas and your political practice are directly tied to being able to communicate and advocate and engage. So I appreciate you uh, coming to this panel. I think you'll be absolutely thrilled with what our panelists have to say. And um, I, I will say we're gonna basically move through the, because I frankly am a mess of organization. Uh, we're gonna move through the panel uh, list of people as it's spelled out in the program. And I think uh, uh, some of it will hang together. The only deviation from that is I'm gonna ask Josh Inwood, who is uh, one of my partners in crime and many other things, to, to allow us to set a big stage. And then when we move to Meg Gilley from Compass, which is not a geographical organization, but she's increasingly involved in helping and assisting geographers. And so uh, I'll introduce people as they come up and uh, thank you again. Well, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Derek and AG for uh, putting this uh, panel together. Um, and I want to echo a lot of what he said here, and I think a lot, I will echo a lot of what he said uh, in terms of, of the importance of public engagement. This is something that he and I have been involved in um, really since uh, your time and our time together at, at, at Tennessee. Um, but I'll say this as well. I think in the wake of the Trump election, uh, it's taken on a bit more uh, a sense of urgency. And, and I'm very lucky to work at an institution like Penn State, which has taken kind of public engagement in the wake of the Trump election uh, very seriously. Um, Lisa Nelson was just here. I, I don't know if she's still in the audience, but she's taken the task of organizing uh, some teach-ins along with a group of concerned faculty. Um, there's two grad students I know here from Penn State University, um, uh, Lauren and Eden, Lauren and Eden, uh, who are also here. And uh, they really took it upon themselves. Next year, we'll be hosting the uh, Critical Geography Conference at Penn State, which is also a shameless plug uh, for the Penn State Critical Geography Conference. And they really took it on themselves to kind of rewrite the call for papers and to bring in a session in particular with Manel Matani that talks about how to engage with um, reporters. Um, and so those will be some of the things that we're working on there. And so um, as a way of placing the comments that I'm about to give into some kind of context, but in also illustrating why I consider this to be of increasing importance, public engagement, not just for as, us as academics, for, but for the very health and survivability of the planet, I want to illustrate the importance of public media presence and engagement with a couple of recent stories. First, Arctic and climate scholar, as well as National Geographic explorer Victoria Herman wrote in the Guardian newspaper just last week about the systemic and coordinated deletion of Arctic climate data from government websites and databases. As she writes, she is used to data gaps about the Arctic. Just over 1% of the US Arctic waters have been surveyed to modern standards, and many of the maps that are used to understand the Arctic have not been updated since the end of the Second World War. But as she also writes, over the last two months, I've been navigating a different type of uncharted territory the deleting of what little data we have by the Trump administration. She goes on to say, quote, since January, the surge has transformed into a slow, incessant march of deleting data sets, web pages, and policies about the Arctic. I now come to expect a weekly email request to replace invalid citations, hoping that someone had the foresight to download statistics about Arctic permafrost thaw or renewable energy in advance of the purge. Yet to see the Trump administration's efforts as an aberration is to miss the broader global effort to deny and destroy climate data. For as she also writes, we've seen this type of data strangling before. Just three years ago, Arctic researchers witnessed another world leader remove thousands of scientific documents from the public domain. In 2014, then Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper closed 11 Department of Fisheries and Ocean Regional Libraries, including the only Arctic center. Hundreds of reports and studies containing well over a century of research were destroyed in that process. She writes that it's a historic loss from which we may never recover. Another example from the Atlantic. In 2016, the ACLU of California released emails showing that Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram provided Geophedia, 
a social media monitoring company used by several law enforcement agencies nationwide, specialized access to feeds of bulk public data. Geofedia used the feed to spy on Black Lives Matter activists in Ferguson and Baltimore in the wake of the uprisings. However, the tables were turned when a group of digital activists in Chicago, and whose inspiration comes from radical labor organizer Lucy Parsons, created Open Oversight. The Open Oversight website, quote, seeks to match the names and badge numbers of officers obtained by records requests with photos drawn from social media to help people file misconduct complaints against the police and facilitates in greater police accountability. In explaining the rationale of the project, the Open Oversight Director noted, the initial idea for the project came from looking at how police do social media monitoring. We talked to people who had been victims of police abuse and had gone to file complaints, but were told, if you don't know the badge number and name, nothing is going to happen, end quote. These examples illustrate the potential and perils of social media and the confluence of social media, academics, and the potential for public engagement that is of increasing importance in the Trump era. First, the assault of knowledge by those forces whose lives and fortunes are made possible by the status quo or by, not, by denying knowledge has a long and troubling history. From the banning of books to outright book burning, to McCarthy-era attacks on academic freedom, to more recent examples of scholars being forced out of jobs or denied employment because of unpopular political opinions, amongst myriad other examples, illustrate that the production of knowledge has never been as simple or as easy as publishing papers, teaching courses, or attending university meetings. More so, these examples illustrate the life and death struggle that many communities are confronting in an era of increasingly defined by a violent and ascendant white alt-right nationalism. For this reason, I consider public engagement to be vital to the work that we do. And by public engagement, I mean a range of endeavors, including the writing of op-eds for newspapers, the sharing of research on social media platforms, the organization of teach-ins, public speaking engagements, protesting, the reaching out to politicians and congressmen and whoever in our communities makes decisions, and the do donation of free labor to social justice groups who are in need of sometimes technical, but oftentimes just free labor to achieve their goals. Recently in The Professional Geographer, Kate Derrickson and Paul Rutledge, and writing through the concept of resourcefulness, envision at least three ways that academics can contribute to broader communities and to the public. First, they note, Scholars can commit to channeling the resources and privileges afforded academics to advancing non-academic collaborators. As they note, this is sometimes as easy as volunteering to buy pizza for community meetings or giving folks a ride to a community meeting. One of the major lessons I've learned in my own public engagement is that much of the work of engaging with the public is simply being available and connected to the communities in which we live and work. And one of the consequences of our contemporary neoliberal era is that the limited resources that were once available for community organizations are increasingly being squeezed. And the reality is, if Trump and the Republican Congress pass even a tenth of the budget that they proposed, those resources will become even less available for communities and community organizations. Second, they note that engagements with a broader community can take many forms of research designed explicitly to ask and answer questions that non-academic collaborators face and in affecting the change they want to see and how social relations might be transformed. I think this is an important point and one that is not necessarily stressed enough. While public engagement can take many forms and can happen in the most surprising of places, and I have no doubt that our panelists will, will surprise us with some of the, the efforts that they've done, I often find that many academics treat the conversation and conception of public engagement as a kind of one-way street where our knowledge flows forth. The reality is, that many of my most fruitful public engagements include the sharing of information and oftentimes in a more collaborative process than most research and writing processes that I have engaged in. Therefore, it is important to actively cultivate and seek out long-standing and fruitful relationships and for us to move away from the one and done model of public engagement, which I think predominates in a lot of the discussions that we have about it. Third, there is a critical need for research and engagement that explores the barriers to sustained and active participation in activism. Geographers have a lot to offer in this area, and I can speak more to that if there are obviously questions. Finally, and by way of kind of closing and wrapping up this, in, this initial set of commentaries, I want to leave you with a number, and that number is 34.5%. That is the number of men and women in the United States over 25 years of age who have attained a university degree or really have attended the university in any kind of way, shape, or form. The reality is that for the vast majority of people in the United States, they do not have a university degree and a large percentage have no experience 
with higher education apart from what they glean from the broader society. As a result, we are easily stereotyped by politicians and large-pocketed campaign donors who find what we do inconvenient to their plans and their pollution and their wars and their racism and their homophobia and their sexism and their ability to wrench profit out of the lives of the marginal. What we do matters, not only for the long-term viability and health of our communities, but also for our planet and our long-term survivability as a species. For this reason, public engagement matters. And when I think about public engagement, my view is that it's the front porch of higher education. It's an invitation to the vast majority of people in this country who have no university experience, not because of a lack of IQ, not because of a lack of drive, but in many cases, a lack of resources or a lack of opportunity to attend university. By bringing our work to the broader public and explaining and engaging and collaborating with the public, Opportunities abound to destroy and undermine the discourses of ivory tower elites and anti-intellectualism, which, which is a destructive and destabilizing force undermining the very viability of institutions of higher education in the first place. That is why I encourage all of us here to become more involved in public engagement and outreach and to work to cultivate a public presence and to engage in a kind of scholar activism. Thank you. Uh, anybody that knows me really well knows I'm a recovering Baptist, and uh, and in the old time Baptist church, you always had to have somebody get that uh, that uh, emotion and passion going, and that's what Josh Inwood's about. So uh, thank you very much, Josh, for those very insightful comments and, and getting us excited. I'd like to ask uh, Meg Gilly to from Compass to uh, come up. She's going to tell you a little bit about herself and about what the organization. I hope we don't lose somebody here. Uh, what the organization Compass is about, and I'm proud to say that uh, Meg will be leading a workshop with our department chairs at their luncheon right after this session, uh, and so she's really giving quite, quite a bit of herself to AG. Thank you very much, Meg. Well, thank you, thank you for having me on this panel today. Um, my name is, can everyone hear me? Just, I can be louder if I need to, all right. Louder, I will be louder, okay. I will, I will lean in. Uh, my name is Meg Gilly and I'm with Compass. Uh, Compass is a nonprofit organization that helps scientists and researchers more effectively share their work with society. Uh, primarily, we do that through connecting people with policymakers in the media, but we work with many other audiences. And we have our roots in environmental science, but I think the messages that I have to share with you today are really broadly applicable and move well beyond the environment. So we have a couple of core beliefs at Compass, one of which is that there is incredible research out there in the world, but it often doesn't get into the hands of those who make decisions. We've actually found that if you are only publishing in academic journals, virtually no one outside your community will receive your information. And anecdotally, I can say this is absolutely true. We also believe that scientists and researchers have knowledge and insights that can inform decisions and make the world a better place. We believe that decisions informed by science are just fundamentally better than decisions that aren't. And finally, we believe that all of you can and should be public intellectuals. And we can try to help you be even more effective at that. So what do I actually do what I, at Compass? Um, there are two big things. The first is that I do workshops across the country with scientists and researchers to help improve their science communication skills and to help them dream up ways to engage. Um, and I work with academic scientists, I work with uh, NGOs, I work with federal and state agencies. Um, the other half of my job is really uh, takes place in Washington, D.C., where I live and work. Um, I spend a lot of time keeping my ear to the ground on Capitol Hill and in the federal agencies to figure out where the voice of science and research should be at the table, but it isn't. And then I try to find the right people to bring to those conversations and, and get, make them a place at the table. That's, that's pretty oversimplified, but I'm happy to talk more about it if you all have questions. So the upshot is that I am really familiar with the federal policy process and maybe a little too familiar with the current political climate in DC. Um, so that's what I'm going to speak to today is my experience um, helping scientists and researchers engage with federal policy. I also just want to mention that Compass is non-advocacy, so that means that we don't advocate for specific policy outcomes, 
Um, but what it, we do support is scientists who may want to do that. So um, there's no judgment here. I just want to say that I can't specifically advocate for certain policies. So I think there are two things that I want you all to walk away with knowing about policy change, making policy change happen. The first is that we do not lack information. What we lack is information that's understandable, that's relevant, that's credible, and that's salient. There is a deluge of information available coming from all sides, but most of it's just not something that policy staff can make sense of or use. They probably haven't studied geography since middle school or high school at best. Um, and so you have to really realize that and speak to that. The second thing I wanna say, and this kind of speaks to what Josh said, is that policy is a long game. Um, I am thrilled by the current enthusiasm we have for engagement, but it is a long game built on relationships and it takes time. Um, so if you have to choose between being the tortoise and the hare, I would really encourage you guys to be the tortoise in this situation. And I do come today with some great news for you guys, some silver linings. I think that insights from the geography community are in incredibly high demand right now. Um, so many of the questions that I hear from policy staff are fundamentally geography questions. They're some mixture of social science and natural science with a spatial component, which in my head is kind of like, well, that's, that sounds like geography to me. So I think in that way, you all have a lot to bring to bear to this conversation. And so with that, I'm just gonna close with three suggestions to help the rubber meet the road. Um, the first is to build or join a community that's gonna support you and keep you accountable. I know that maybe not all of you f feel super supported by the institutions you're at, or maybe your colleagues don't see the value of being a public intellectual, but there are people out there who do. There are lots of online forums. Um, there are probably a government affairs or communications staff at your institution you can talk to. I know that the AAG has some great policy staff who I'm sure would love to talk to you. Um, build that community around you because each person's path is different, but they can really help you take the first steps. My second suggestion is to think really deeply about the role that you want to play in policy. Um, there's a whole spectrum you can choose from, from kind of a impartial broker of information all the way up to a very strong issue advocate and anywhere in between. And all of those positions are, are wonderful and great, but you don't want to make that decision when you're sitting down with a policymaker for the first time. That's something to really think about ahead of time. And the third thing that I want to share with you is don't assume that coming to DC to talk with policymakers is the best or the only way to engage. I know that it's really popular right now and everyone feels really enthusiastic about coming and I think it's, it's totally, um, a, definitely a place to make change. But I would also encourage you to um, start talking to your neighbors or to your dog walker, or to your Uber or taxi driver or that guy that's sitting next to you on the airplane on your way home from this conference, because they need to hear this information too, and you um, might find yourself sitting next to Senator Markey on the airplane like I found myself in January of this year. So really people talking to people is how social change happens, so I really just wanna um, emphasize that. And I will end with saying that um, unlike a lot of the people on this panel, I have the luxury of doing this for my job all the time. And I'm really lucky for that. And so um, part of what I'm here to do is to help all of you. So um, my contact information are on these little sheets that I, I brought and I'll have business cards, but I am here for the week and I'm happy to talk to all of you if you have questions or just wanna talk. Um, so I'd encourage you to reach out to me. And with that, I will pass off to the next person. you give me just a second, I'm going to get our next uh, speaker's presentation up. Uh, it's, I, one of the things that I really enjoy about having Meg part of this discussion is that I've always believed that part of this engagement and this intellectualism is to, in fact, uh, engage with other organizations. And so I really think geographers can benefit greatly from, in fact, reaching out and establishing good ties and relations with folks like Compass. And there are other organizations, not to take anything away from Compass, they're also into the business of helping prepare academics and other industry people to do this kind of work. Uh, without further delay, 
Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce our next panelist, uh, uh, Sri Ram K. Uh, from uh, this is uh, Western Oregon University, and uh, Sri Ram, I have the great honor of serving on the AEG Council with. Uh, he is one of the more vocal and uh, I think uh, uh, really dynamic of our council members. Uh, I can tell you without a doubt he is serving the AEG in a very, very good way. So uh, please join me in thanking Sri Ram. As much as I want to thank Derek, I'm also kind of um, angry at him because he said I have only six to seven minutes for this. Um, so it, 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 is, it is quite a struggle for me to put together something that I'm so passionate about in, in a mere six to seven minutes. And he also said, give us some um, tangible, you know, to use his phrase, the rubber meets the road, uh, uh, give us tangible things to do kind of a way. Um, I have a bunch of different examples, printouts uh, up in the front. So later on, if you want to pick them up, um, uh, feel free. Uh, I, I think I brought maybe 20 copies of a couple of different examples. So the first thing I want to tell you is um, if we think that only now is the time to be an awesome public intellectual, uh, we, are, we are mistaken. Uh, it has always been an awesome time to be public intellectuals. And there are plenty, plenty, plenty of people doing a phenomenal job of being public intellectuals. So here is an example, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that most of you um, recognize all the, all the faces here, and maybe some of you recognize some of the faces. These are all highly educated, wonderful public intellectuals. And in the reality is, in our day-to-day -day conversations, we are not, almost always, not quoting academics who publish in those top tier publications, almost always, we are always quoting these kinds of public intellectuals. My question right from my graduate school days has been, how come academics never wanted to be like these people? I could never understand. I have failed to do that, but at least I've been trying, right? So the model, though, that we've been operating under, when we think of public intellectuals, we don't necessarily think about people's, people like these we tend to think about people like this, right? We tend to think about people who are established academics, um, not everybody winning the Nobel Prize, but established academics who are also then able to engage with the public. That is our model. But, but maybe one of the things that, um, that educational institutions need to think about is how to create these kinds of intellectuals as well via the very rigorous curriculum that we, that we have in institutions. The biggest challenge is our lack of imagination. It is as simple as that. And, and the lack of imagination then translates to various kinds of institutional structures. Um, so, you, you know, I could spend maybe two hours talking to you about how the whole entire tenure promotion process is skewed against performing as public intellectuals, right? So, so there are so many different ways in which we can think about how we lack, we as individuals, we as various institutions, simply lack the imagination for that public intellectual engagement. The, um, the awesome thing now um, is we, 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 f we find that we are often looking at John Stewart over the last few years until he retired. We are looking at Stephen Colbert. We are looking at um, uh, comedians to make sense of the world. So, so this is from the Atlantic um, uh, where they said, hey, you know, the people are actually turning to comedians to make sense of the world. Comedians are becoming public intellectuals. So guess what we academics do? We turn around, we call for papers American stand-up comedians as public intellectuals. You know, do any of you want to talk about this? We, you know, the reality is I think we are completely messed up, but that's a different story. So, in responding to, <clears throat> in responding to the charge that, that Derek gave me, um, here are two things that, that I want to emphasize. As, as faculty in the classrooms, we've always dealt with a captive audience. We tell, we tell students what we want to tell them, and it works great, right? It doesn't work that way with the public. The, the public really doesn't care about what we really want to talk about. So, 
It is not, it is not, it is not about my favorite topics. It is about what the public is interested in. Uh, uh, so the, the snapshot that I have is from one of the, uh, the op-eds that I wrote where I, I captured um, the, the public interest in, in, in the renaming of institutions, renaming of colleges that were related to some of the darker aspects of history. And I tied it to uh, the local uh, discussions that were happening with the University of Oregon. Um, the, uh, the other thing that we need to keep in mind that just because we have a PhD and just because we, we operate in a university, the public does not need to hear us at all. Um, we need to make the case to the public. We need to make the case for the public, right? Um, so again, the, the, we have, we, you know, the reality is all the research that we do can easily morph into, and I think that's what um, uh, the Compass organization is also about. Uh, the, most of the research that we do can easily morph into these kinds of things. You know, can we then massage that in a way that appeals to the public interest and therefore contribute to the public engagement? Um, I, uh, when, when we think about public intellectuals, then we think about Paul Krugman, and then we think about the New York Times, and everybody wants to write an op-ed to the New York Times. I want to remind you, you know, even Paul Krugman didn't start at the New York Times, right? For those of us who have been following uh, that aspect of public intellectual engagement, we, we remember from a long time ago when Slate was a wonderful experiment that Microsoft put together. Um, that is where Paul Krugman uh, began with Slate, Slate.com. Um, after a couple of years of establishing himself there, then he was hired by, by the New York Times in 1999. I, all of us have to begin somewhere, right? So the public intellectual engagement doesn't necessarily mean only writing for the New York Times or for the Washington Post. I, I want to end with this. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, during my presidential address to the, uh, the Pacific Coast Division, the, uh, the APCG, I talked about uh, a whole bunch of these kinds of issues. Um, I have the complete citation details uh, in one of the, the handouts I have up here. Uh, for copyright reasons, I didn't want to print the entire article and provide copies here. But, but essentially, that is what I think we need to keep in mind, that when we do geography, when we think geography, when we talk geography, we need to consider, we need to reframe all that very rigorous academic way of thinking into public scholarship. All right. So with that, I'm done. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you, folks. Uh, I, I really just can't express enough how much Shi Ram's work has inspired me the last several months. Uh, I'm really so happy that you, in fact, uh, gave us that, uh, that ending slide about uh, geography as public scholarship because I'm, I'm getting a very strong feeling that the presidential plenary for New Orleans next year will be somewhere along those lines and further discussions of engagement. So the, this will certainly carry on and, and we will build on some of that excellent work. Uh, just to let my uh, panelists know, uh, this is sort of like Johnny Cash. You got to lean into this mic, all right? Uh, so it's, uh, it's 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 a tough mic. Uh, I'd like to call now uh, Bill Mosley from McAllister College to come up and to uh, give his remarks. Uh, longtime friend, everybody everybody watch it. Uh, longtime friend and colleague, Bill Mosley, since grad school days, and Bill has really, in many ways, like Sri Ram mastered uh, a lot of the op-ed and uh, leveraging of media. So thank, thank you, Derek. Thanks for including me in this panel. Um, what Derek's not telling you is I was his TA in grad school, which was a mind-blowing experience. Um, it's really heartening for me to see uh, this um, topic um, getting an emphasis uh, at the annual meeting. Uh, I've participated in these sorts of forums in the past, and the room was an eighth of the size, and, and there were just a few people in the room. So I guess I have Donald Trump to, to thank for that, that there is this sort of growing interest in uh, public intellectualism and civic engagement. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about why I think it's important to engage, uh, a little bit about sort of old versus new media, and then some tips 
and in particular the type of, you know, lots of types of public scholarship and I'm going to be focusing in particular on sort of opinion pieces that appear in both print media uh, and in, in, in new media. So for starters, I think sometimes um, geographers can have uh, an inferiority complex and sometimes we beat ourselves up uh, for being particularly uh, bad at public scholarship. Uh, a few years ago, a student and I um, did some research that was published in uh, 2011 in Applied Geography, and we looked at seven different fields in terms of um, op-ed productivity. And it's true in an absolute sense, uh, when we compared these fields, uh, poli sci, econ, sos, geography, anthro, geology, biology, it, we're, we're at the back of the line in terms of total productivity. But if you, you consider the fact that we're a small discipline and you normalize these figures, we're actually fourth. We're right in the middle of the pack. And where I'm from, Minnesota, you know, geography, or being average is okay. Um, <laughs> but I do think it's interesting to, to think about who's ahead of us. Uh, economics and political science are at the front of the pack and they've had a huge impact on um, kind of framing public discourse in this country. The one that's just ahead of us, which I think is an interesting case, is sociology, which is also a small discipline. But about a decade ago, they made a very concerted effort, led by their then president, Burroway, to become more engaged and to highlight the importance of public intellectualism, and I think it made a difference in their field. And so um, I, I see us doing now, and I think that's, that's terribly important. So I think we all come to this for, for different reasons. I think personal histories matter. In my own case, um, I, I have a master's degree in public, public policy, so I've long been interested in the public sphere. But then I worked for 10 years before I went back to school for my PhD, mostly in international development. And so I had this sort of long interest in policy and practice. And I think that um, led me to be interested in, uh, this, the, in public scholarship. And I was encouraged by other geographers who were at the head of the AEG about a decade ago, most notably Alec Murphy, who was writing about the, pub the importance of, of public scholarship. And Alec and others have written about how in the US context, um, the tradition of being a public intellectual is less well-developed than it is, say, in the European context. And there is this sort of tradition in the United States of anti-intellectualism. Um, this sort of, this binary, right, between the university educated that Josh was talking about, the sort of formal book knowledge that we get in educational institutions, and that is set aside a, a, a kind of a more uh, kind of um, populist understanding of the world, which is based on people's everyday lives and their experiential knowledge. And I do think public intellectualism, engaging with wider publics, begins to break down that binary, right? Bridging the worlds of sort of formal book knowledge and experiential knowledge, both of which have something very important to, to contribute. Um, you know, I, I guess I feel like being a public intellectual, it's, it's somewhat of an ethical obligation. We, as academics, it's a pretty good gig, right? We, we have the luxury of sort of devoting our lives to focus on issues that are of interest to us. And we develop a certain amount of expertise on those issues. And then I think if those come up in the public sphere, we have an obligation to sort of share our understanding of the particular problem. And, you know, to paraphrase Karl Marx, you know, if, 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 you know, if, you're, if you're producing knowledge, if you're engaging in the knowledge production process, you know, what's the point if it doesn't somehow change what's going on in the world? Um, Alec and others um, have argued that public discussions are impoverished um, if, if geographers don't contribute. And so as I mentioned at the start, a lot of our discourses have been shaped by economics and pol political science, and I think geographers have something important to contribute. And sometimes um, I think those of us who are sort of interested in theory are um, less inclined to, to think about applied issues. But I think being a public scholar is not just, you know, you're not constrained working on an applied problem, but you're contributing to how we frame that problem, how we think about that problem, which can have a huge impact on the solutions that evolve out of that. Um, I think another reason to become more engaged is it can actually shape your own scholarship. And so I cannot tell you how many times how I've written about a particular topic 
because I, you know, it was, it was in the public sphere and I thought I had something to say about it, but then that led to uh, a, a series of kind of changes in my own thinking and um, uh, informed my scholarship and led me to look at issues that are kind of more germane to, to the public sphere. New media, social media. I think, you know, I grew up reading newspapers. I love new, new, uh, newspapers, the print media, um, you know, Sunday morning with, with, with that, that physical copy of the paper and a coffee, that, that for me is nirvana. And so I came very late to social media and I poo-pooed it for a long time as not being very constructive. But I think I was drawn into it in particular because of place I've longed work, Mali went through a coup d'etat in 2012, an Islamist rebellion in 2013. I was sort of starved for information and the way I could get it was through social media. And then if I wanted to participate in these discussions, I had to get on those platforms. And so I've sort of become a late convert. This is a way that I've been able to share my sort of more traditional scholarship and it's allowed me to connect sort of academics with public officials, with uh, reporters who are all uh, kind of engaging with, with social media. I think there's this big question of how you get started, right? And you know, I think many of us are sort of sit around, sitting around in our offices waiting for that phone call, right? The, the reporter who's gonna call us and ask us to contribute our, wind, our, our wisdom. And so I work in West and Southern Africa on issues of environment, food security, agriculture, and frankly, very few people in the United States care about these issues. So my phone was not ringing. And so that's how I got into sort of writing opinion pieces because in that instance, I, you know, I saw connections between what I was doing and sort of issues in the public and I could make those connections through writing opinion pieces. Um, I did start out very, very small writing for small local papers. Um, I think you get better at this with practice. And I, you know, I got lucky, I have been able to publish pieces uh, in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, but most of my writing today is for uh, Al Jazeera English where I, I write a sort of quasi uh, regular column. Um, Derek asked us to offer some tips. Um, and I was, uh, uh, not good at kind of creating a handout for you, although um, a student and I did write an article that was published in 2010 in the Geographical Review on engaging with the public imagination, um, which is basically a series of tips, and I'm more than happy to share that article with folks um, if they just email me. But um, a couple of issues, right? The style of writing is very, very different than most academics are used to. You have to very quickly kind of get your point out there, grab your, grab your reader's attention, and be very succinct, which is incredibly difficult for, for academics to do. And it's, for most issues, there's a very limited kind of time uh, frame in which you can intervene. And so you have to be willing to kind of, uh, you know, be engaged with the public discussion and realize that if you don't do this in, in, a, in, in 48 hours, um, it's, your chances of getting it published uh, are, are, are very low. So for me, it's oftentimes, you know, I get angry, I get exercised, and like, some like, passion kind of drives this, and it allows me to get it, get it out quickly. Um, I have done some interview work. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to get on the Rolodex of, of a reporter. Um, they do have certain networks. But part of, the, I mean, part of it is frankly just being there, answering the phone when somebody calls and, and being willing to give them the time of day. And oftentimes, you know, you're way overworked, you got lots of other things to do, um, and it's sort of hard to justify giving attention to this, to this particular topic. Um, oftentimes, you know, with, with interviews, whether they be in print media or on the radio or the TV, um, you're not in control of the situation. It's very improvisational. The reporter has their agenda. You, 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 it's hard to anticipate the questions. And so you really have to think about what's your agenda, what's the message you want to get across, and taking the questions that are offered to you and you know, answering them, but also adding your particular, uh, your, your particular spin. Um, 
And it's, it's, I guess my last point is it's, it's a skill, right? It's hard. I've been, I've done TV interviews. Um, I remember one very uh, vividly with Al Jazeera. Um, I'm in Minneapolis, St. Paul. The moderator's in Doha. There are other scholars in New York and London. I, I can't see any of these people. I'm just looking at a TV ca camera and it's very sort of disconcerting. It's not like a normal conversation but you do get better at it over time with practice. And so, as Siren mentioned, um, start small and gradually build up um, and, 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 you, and you will make an impact. It's important, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I'd like to call Rebecca Torres from University of Texas at Austin to come speak. I've also known Rebecca for a long time this, not everyone up here is my friend, but maybe after this is all over with, they will be. Uh, but thank you, Rebecca. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Derek, for organizing this and also to all the great panelists. I've already learned a lot. Um, today, I just wanted to limit my comments to a particular type of public scholarship, which is activist scholarship. Uh, I think for some, quite some time, there has been a growing recognition that uh, there's a need for scholars to work with local communities as partners, uh, and also uh, the, the value of the co-production of knowledge, um, and uh, the need for the, the academy to start channeling some of these wonderful resources that we have at the university towards local communities. So this isn't anything new. But I think that under uh, the Trump regime's threats that we're facing, I work with migrants and refugees, um, so it's been really very disconcerting. But uh, so many things are under attack. Minorities, women, education, science, the environment, so many aspects of life. I think that activist and engaged research is even more important now. And I think we have some really great examples of geographers who have done some amazing work. And I have a handout where I have listed some tips, but also I have referenced some people in geography that we can look to and learn from. And I do believe that now is a, a time, and maybe we were talking, I was talking to Meg about silver linings, and maybe a silver lining in all of this is that uh, we could have a, a, an activist turn or a, a turn towards public scholarship. Um, as a response to the battles that we're going to need to fight ahead. Um, we, we need to support um, members of the community, but also the activists and the scientists and um, advocates uh, for people who are under attack. Um, so I want to briefly discuss, you know, what is activist scholarship and give you one example. I've been involved in a few different experiences, but I'm going to give you one in particular. And then I'm just going to conclude with some of the opportunities and challenges uh, with activist scholarships. So one of my colleagues at UT Austin, uh, he's an anthropologist, but he has been at the forefront of really trying to um, validate activist scholarship in our university, uh, have it recognized in the, in the tenure and promotion process, um, and a, as a, a valid form of scholarship. And his definition, and, and I think there are many ways of, of defining this, but just to get, share with you how he defines it, uh, he defines it as a way to better understand the root causes of inequality, oppression, violence, and human suffering that is carried out in collaboration with the people who are subject to those conditions, and it's used with the people to formulate strategies to achieve power to transform those conditions. So activist research can take many forms. It can be partnering with advocacy groups, schools, activist organizations, uh, finding ways to leverage the university resources that we have available and creative ways to support these initiatives, things like service learning courses, uh, using class projects to get things done, uh, student internships, internal grants that you have available, um, participatory action research projects, of course, and then disseminating results in different ways through lobbying, public reports, fact sheets, op-eds, presentations, testifying, serving as an expert witness, and um, 
and some and the panels have presented a lot of different great ways of, of how to do this. Um, so um, the one example uh, then that I'm going to share with you was in collaboration with a uh, geographer colleague, um, Rich Heyman, uh, who uh, worked on this project as well, and also um, Nick Theodore, uh, a, another geographer, um, provided um, uh, expertise and training to the project. So in 2009, the Proyecto de Defensa Laboral, or the Workers' Defense Project, which is a community-based uh, worker center, approached some UT faculty members requesting help for a study that they wanted to conduct on the conditions of, of construction workers in Austin, one of the fastest growing cities and which employs a, a large percent of the construction labor is Latino and also Texas has one of the worst safety, it's the most dangerous place to be uh, a construction worker in the country. Um, so the result of this was a participatory activist initiative resulting in one of the most extensive studies to date on the construction industry. And the, the primary purpose of the study, which was titled Building Austin, Building Injustice, was to better understand these conditions of the, uh, the construction industry and to try to promote fair labor practices uh, in Austin and also legislation. Uh, so we were able to sort of bootstrap this, starting very small with um, just little internal pots of funding that we found at the university for research assistants, undergrad interns. Um, Rich did a great, great um, project with his class. And the results revealed, not surprisingly, that the industry plays a very vital role in the city's economy, but most of the jobs in construction fail to meet the basic needs for workers and their families who are, again, in this case, um, Latino immigrants. And despite some very bleak findings from the study, um, th it really led to some important breakthroughs in both Austin and in Texas in terms of the construction industry. So one of the first things that, that came out of this is that um, OSHA conducted a federal investigation into the Texas construction industry, which led to a 60% increase in co construction safety inspections throughout the whole state. So that was a, was a big outcome. Also, uh, in 2010, the Austin City Council passed an ordinance that required employers in the construction industry to give people a, um, a 10 minute work break every four hours, a break, a water break. Now that, was shocking to me that that did not exist, that this was like a huge uh, win for us to be able to get a, a water break every four hours. Um, so the project was originally purely for advocacy purposes, but I, I do have to say that um, after the NGO used most of the results, we, you know, we had gotten pretty close and, and um, they were open to also working with us on some some academic um, output from this. So we were able to write a geo forum paper based on the experience and we, you know, I presented at the AG and shared this and, and also at UCLA. Um, so um, overall then, uh, some of the opportunities associated with activist research, uh, some that I've mentioned, but just to review, are, are generating results that are uh, beneficial for policy, for stimulating public debate and social change. Also, um, even though these engagements really do require a long time and a lot of work, uh, they do provide for greater access. Uh, so I really do believe that like the, the empirical results and knowledge uh, that you can obtain are, are much deeper. Also, there's uh, a potential for more innovative theory, I think, when you're engaging in this way. Uh, there were great opportunities for training and enrichment for students, uh, inculcating this ethos of activism in students, which is really where it needs to start, not later when you're trying to figure it out in a new faculty position. Um, and also, um, it leads to greater accountability and reciprocity in the research process. So there are a number of challenges associated with activist research, uh, which include a lot of tensions and ethical dilemmas that emerge because you do become, you're in this insider, outsider position and this issue of the, the field and real world become blurred 
And so that presents itself with a lot of challenges. Also, as scholars, we, we don't necessarily have the experience or the training, and there are certain methods that uh, lend them that are more conducive to activist research, and so we may not be trained in that. Um, also, the, uh, the real world and academia tend to operate under very different time frames and constraints. Um, so it can take years for a scholar to gain trust and build these reciprocal relationships. Another uh, challenge is that uh, with the neoliberalization of the university, especially with the pressure that tenure track faculty face um, for productivity, uh, this really can discourage um, participation in activist research and community engagement. So the message all too often to early faculty is just get in there, close your door, and write. Um, so in conclusion, um, I just wanted to uh, end with a few questions. I don't know if we'll have a lot of time for discussion, but I would love to hear from anybody else any other experiences, because I know that um, geographers have, have, have really been active. Uh, in terms of what have been your opportunities and, and challenges, what, how have you overcome this? And also any thoughts on how we can use activist research to, to face the threats ahead um, that are posed under this new administration? Thanks. I, I had the pleasure of first uh, getting to know Rebecca and serving with her at East Carolina University when we were there together as assistant professors. And she really was a, a great role model for uh, community-based uh, uh, research and, and outreach. And so thank you very much, Rebecca. I'd like to bring up uh, Joseph Wood from the uh, University of Baltimore. And uh, I first stumbled upon uh, Joseph. I've known him for a long time, but we got to know each other a little bit better at a recent race, ethnicity, and place meeting. I heard about some of his great work going on in uh, Baltimore and with his university. Welcome. Thank you, Derek. <clears throat> Let me uh, start with a couple of references to some things in the news uh, these days. Uh, the lead story in the Chronicle of Higher Education electronic edition today, which I know you've all had a chance to read, right, uh, is entitled Triumph of the Thought Leader, uh, ellipsis, and the Eclipse of the Public Intellectual. And in some ways, I, I don't actually dispute that, but I think what we're learning today and what I want to try to talk about is how we can all be intellectuals in the public. And then as I try to illustrate that, I, I want to start with uh, something else in the news today. Yesterday, a uh, federal judge, uh, considering a proposed delay on the consent decree with the Baltimore Police Department uh, that came from uh, the present uh, attorney general, denied that uh, request to delay, uh, which means that uh, the consent decree should go forward. It may be announced today or tomorrow. Uh, Baltimore civic and business leaders very much supported the consent decree uh, to uh, bring community policing to Baltimore uh, and have been quite eager to get on with it. So uh, they challenged the uh, Department of Justice's effort to uh, delay it. Um, so why are these two stories important? Uh, because much of the civic and business leadership in Baltimore understands that the concentration of poverty in certain neighborhoods in certain parts of the city is structural, not behavioral. This understanding is not by accident. So let me back up and try to say a little bit about why and how the community uh, itself is very much cognizant of things that we otherwise teach in urban geography or what have you. Uh, I, I want to back up to Freddie Gray. That's why I'm here. Um, not that I knew Freddie, uh, but my university is very close to the neighborhood that Freddie lived in, uh, in April 2015. Um, as I write in a forthcoming uh, AAG review of books, review essay on race, on race in Baltimore, uh, Wolf Blitzer commented on CNN during uh, the unrest in Baltimore. That's what we like to call it in Baltimore, the unrest. Um, he said he could not believe that what was happening in Baltimore in 2015 could happen in America 
he just couldn't believe it. To those of us who live and work in Baltimore, uh, it, this was at best uh, disingenuous. So my university, University of Baltimore, not the University of Maryland of Baltimore, not the University of Maryland of Baltimore County, the University of Baltimore, all right, um, was affected. Access to campus was um, constrained by police barricades and things like that. Uh, many of our students live in the neighborhoods that were affected, uh, not far from the university. Uh, many walk to the university or take public transportation, much of which uh, precluded uh, them getting to class. So we actually pretty much closed the university for a week. But we did a number of other things in response, and that's uh, what I know Derek wants me to talk about. Um, I developed and led a course called Divided Baltimore in the fall of 2015. The focus was on how Baltimore became segregated, what that means if you live and work in Baltimore for everyone, and what we can do about it. It was multidisciplinary, but very clearly uh, through a geographical lens. It was team taught. I brought in colleagues from across the university and from the community. It was built around a weekly community forum uh, in a former, the former law school's uh, moot court room um, with as many community members attending a weekly sessions as we had students. This was key, involving the community in the course. And when I say community, I mean people who lived in Sandtown, Winchester, Freddie Gray's neighborhood, uh, foundation leaders, uh, people who were just interested, uh, people who work uh, in social justice, uh, and plain citizens. Um, over the 14-week semester, we had over 30 presenters in TED Talk-like uh, presentations on some aspect of uh, discrimination and structural racism and racial equity. Um, I had UB uh, law professors, business professors, public affairs professors, arts and sciences professors. We had community activists. We had government officials all speaking. And the students themselves made presentations back to the community members. We used a, a blog because, uh, of course, those of you who know that a learning management system, you probably all now use those, uh, are for registered students only. So we wanted the community to be engaged, so we created a blog. Uh, we fully streamed every community forum on the web and captured uh, on video all of those presentations. Uh, students broke out into course level groups to discuss and develop their projects. We had uh, high school teachers developing curriculum. Uh, the City College, which is the, uh, the the premier public high school in Baltimore now has its own divided Baltimore course uh, taught by an English professor. Um, they blog for other teachers. Other graduate students develop social entrepreneurship projects, uh, various public uh, policy position statements. We had undergraduates as well, a number interested in the arts. Uh, one of our students uh, was uh, appointed the Youth Poet Laureate for Baltimore. Um, many spoke about the need and their commitment to advocacy, but mostly they reflected on how the course had quite literally changed their lives. Many talked about that. Um, how many of your students have ever told you, uh, this course changed my life? It happens, doesn't it? But how often does it happen? Um, we had dual enrollment high school students who did their own projects on their own neighborhoods. Most of them came from public charter schools. And then community members. And community members got jealous of the students so they started their own dinner club to continue the conversation uh, in the evening. To learn more about the course, I'm not going to talk more about it, you can Google Uniting a Divided Baltimore, New York Times, October 2015. New York Times heard about the course. They came. They did video. Um, they, uh, they, they followed my graduate assistant, uh, an uh, African-American woman uh, who was formerly homeless, around Baltimore, where she pointed out to uh, the New York Times reporter and the cameraman, some of the neighborhoods, uh, or you can talk to me afterwards and I can give you connections to that. So how could we pull off a course like this? Uh, the course, uh, the fall schedule was already set by the time uh, April 2015 came around. This was all done in the summer. It helped, I will admit, that I was provost of the university at the time. Um, and as a provost, I could be an academic dilettante. Um, 
It also helped that my boss, um, uh, UB's president, is Kurt Schmoke, the former mayor, uh, and very much interested in issues like that. But what was much more important uh, was that I could call on and had credibility with civic leaders and activists to bring out the community as speakers, as participants, long before 2015 I had developed these connections. I'm part of an Aspen Institute a community forum uh, on uh, structural racism and racial equity in Baltimore. Um, and as Meg talked about having someone who keeps you focused, this group keeps me focused. Um, and I'm the only academic in the original group. I've brought others into it. Uh, but I interact with foundation leaders, uh, with uh, pastors, uh, with uh, people who have government positions, a lot of nonprofit folks, and we're all interested and we all reinforce one another on working on issues of structural racism. Um, I worked with this group in a number of different ways, and uh, these are important. I developed and supported research on uh, the history and geography of racial segregation by neighborhood, developed talking points for other members to take back uh, to their boards, uh, developed engagement with various activist groups, uh, with foundations. OSI has a Baltimore branch, the only one outside of New York. The Community Foundation. Annie E. Casey has its headquarters in Baltimore, and we included people from there, Associated Black Charities. I hosted public forums on structural racism and on using an equity lens uh, on campus long before 2015. I supported civic lobbying efforts in the city and in Annapolis. And I get called on from time to time to speak to, to various groups. All of this independent of the course, but the course really became uh, a manifestation of the, these connections. From these connections, I could call on community leaders to come uh, and speak in that course. We got uh, access to radio shows to promote the course. Um, the, uh, Kurt Schmoke and I went on the local NPR station, and of course, all they really wanted to know was what advice he had for the mayor, not about the course, but we did get enough words in. We tried to get the course in the Baltimore Business Journal, and all they wanted to know was what's the economic angle. So because of the Aspen Group, I called up the president of PNC Bank in Baltimore, and I said, Laura, I need your help. And she said, what can I do? Uh, and the article ended up being about the economic angle, and oh, by the way, there's this course at the University of Baltimore. That's all we needed. Um, what's been the impact? Uh, UB increasingly is viewed as an anchor institution, uh, not just in terms of hiring and procurement, but providing faculty to support various efforts, providing access uh, for civic forums on campus, offering op-ed pieces by faculty from law or business or public affairs. Our admissions in law, social entrepreneurship, and public affairs are all increasing and increasing diversity as well. Um, there's renewed interest in community studies, uh, and while I'm not teaching directly in the program, uh, they have used Transforming Divided Baltimore as the intro to that program. And we've had some luck in recruiting faculty diversity, um, uh, including um, uh, someone that you may have heard about, um, a former drug dealer from Baltimore who got an MFA from us, now has a column in uh, Salon Magazine and gets uh, quoted by the New York Times from time to time. His name is Dee Watkins. Um, UB faculty members across disciplines now routinely comment on or teach about structural racism and racial equity with respect to a whole range of things, housing, employment, transportation, education, the justice system, public health, food deserts, banking, environmental racism, redevelopment, all of those things. I supported a young historian to do some research one summer um, she's gotten some publications in the traditional sense out of it, but she now speaks to police recruits at the police academy. She's spoken to the NE Casey Foundation Board, regional business associations. Uh, she was able to call on community people to put together a keynote for a conference in public history. Um, as I mentioned, I get asked to speak about the course. Uh, I've spoken to visiting Fulbrighters. I've spoken in higher education conferences on liberal education. I have a renewed passion myself for writing and teaching. After 20 years in central administration as a vice provost, a provost, 
an interim president, back as a provost again. I'm now finally back on the faculty. I'm the only geographer in my university, so I'm professor of history and public affairs. I teach courses on uh, community history and the sociology of race, but always through a geographer's lens. Um, I write differently uh, and for a different audience, as uh, Bill talked about. Um, and you'll see uh, some of that in uh, the next uh, issue of the AAG Review of Books, where I uh, review a sociologist, uh, Tanisi Coates, my colleague Dee Watkins, and a young political scientist at Johns Hopkins by the name of Lester Spence, who's written a book called Knocking the Hustle Against the Neoliberal Turn in Black Politics. Uh, but I, I want to bring this back uh, to geographers. I'm still involved with the community. I continue with the Aspen Institute Work Group. I've been elected to the Maryland Humanities Council, where I can have influence on grants, putting grants in parts of Baltimore where people don't even know how to ask for those grants or other race issues around Maryland. And unfortunately found myself chairing a city commission on coordinating funding for ending, ending homelessness. It's a geographical topic, topic, of course, that crosses racial lines, but it draws on the respect that I have been able to develop in the community for this engagement uh, as an academic. And the fact that I'm the only person on the board uh, that has neither experienced homelessness uh, nor needs federal money to provide services. And so I'm the neutral party, so to speak. Um, some lessons, and I'll be quick about this. First of all, let me take a moment to say that I, I come from the perspective of Richard Rorty, who argues in Achieving Our Country, which is now 20 years old, that, and I quote him, leftists in the academy have permitted cultural politics to supplant real politics, and consequently have no projects to propose to America, no vision of a country to be achieved by building a consensus on the need for specific reforms. Um, and my own terms on that said another way, we can't just complain about neoliberal orders or the neoliberal order. We have to work within it to undermine it and promote the public good as a public good. It also helps that I find myself in a public university, a comprehensive university, uh, an urban university, one that has a lot of professional programs, law, business, public affairs, arts and sciences. Um, it helps to have institutional leadership to support that community engagement. I modeled the way for many of my colleagues who now follow me. Uh, I have funded some of the research uh, out of my office when I was provost. Um, we have faculty rewards for community-based research and teaching. The historian, the young historian I funded last year won the President's Faculty Award, uh, most outstanding faculty member, largely on the work she does in the community. This is really critical stuff, and I know it's things that uh, Rebecca and others have, have suggested as well, but it takes, it takes uh, effort and leadership to build this capacity. A final word. We can all be public intellectuals or intellectuals in the public by working diligently, using our skills as geographers and as academics in our communities to bring about change. But we, uh, can just, we can't just drop in or parachute in or just show up. We have to build credibility as allies, and that takes time, and then we have to stick with it. Thank you. I, I certainly think that one of the consistent themes with Rebecca, with Joe, with actually several of the panelists uh, gets to the idea of relationship building as part of the job of being a public intellectual. It is a, 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 a long-term project rather than just a, a short-term one. Um, and also the idea of the power of listening and sharing, which I think in our business we like to be heard, but sometimes there's great value in actually doing some listening. So uh, I, last but certainly not least, and one of the most patient men at this meeting is uh, Willie Wright from UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, I've, uh, I don't know Willie real well personally, but uh, his, his uh, reputation precedes him. He's a, 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 an active and vital voice uh, within geography and within the idea of graduate students uh, being involved and engaged. Welcome, Willie.
I am going to be brief. Um, so I imagine I was invited to be on this panel because of some things that I and other graduate students at UNC Chapel Hill have done over the last two or three years or so. Uh, and so I'll speak to those things and then finish up with my own suggestions. Uh, I think one of those things is like in my second year, I began blogging. And I was doing that because uh, friends of mine who are all sociologists, by the way, were already blogging. And I was, I was noticing that that was allowing them to be in conversation with other thinkers, right? Specifically via Twitter and other mediums. And so it was allowing them to exchange thought uh, beyond their discipline and beyond acad academia in general. Um, and two, it kept them writing, right? So blogging was a way in which for, for me to push myself to, to write on a fairly somewhat consistent basis, right? And particularly write things that had, uh, that there, for which there was no stage, right, in uh, my discipline or in my classes. Uh, and then in my fourth year, wanting to acknowledge the fact that I was thinking alongside some really dope young scholars, right? Some people like my boy Ori Sami Burton, like Pavita Vasudevan, like my boy Adam Blesso, and wanting to acknowledge their scholarship as, me, as immediately as possible, right? And, and also kind of shirk the uh, tradition within academia that our thought isn't valid until it comes out in a journal like six months to a year later. So, uh, so we created a zine, right? And like pushed that zine. I mean, you can like Google it right now and find it. So we pushed it electronically, but we also kind of printed it and just like dumped it in different places. Uh, just trying to think of a different way to put out our thought as it was coming to us, right? Not wanting to wait till we got some kind of validation from PhDs a year later for something that we knew was important in the moment. Um, but thinking about the topic of, of public intellectuals, um, I know I've become somewhat critical of that now. Uh, one, because I, I see it as a way in which individuals can like uh, exalt themselves, right? Like uh, we, we see these like these kind of cults of personalities that are developing around what they, they publish in different kind of public mediums. And not to say that it isn't important, right? But uh, we learned recently on this panel that sociology made this push towards public scholarship like 10 years ago. But then there was an article that came out in the New York Times like a week ago that it was titled, what if sociologists had as, as much influence as economists? So sociologists have been doing this push for 10 years, but uh, policymakers still value, right, the logics of economists, right? They, they still don't see what sociologists as, as, are producing as, uh, as important to the policy that they, that they make, right? So what, is, what, is, what does that say about us as geographers wanting to go into that realm and, and how valid and how uh, important will it be seen by those who are making these kinds of decisions that are impacting us and the people whom we live next to and who we love and support in different ways. Um, and so with that said, I'm more so interested in not kind of having like a, a sense of the world, but wanting to change the world. And uh, I don't necessarily feel like public scholarship is the best way to do that. Uh, so recently this cat, Kali Akuno, who is the co-director of the Co of Cooperation Jackson, which is an organization based in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and their, their goal is to develop this network of, of uh, cooperatively owned businesses in Jackson. So they're wanting to change the political economy of Jackson, Mississippi, and the state of Mississippi at large, right? Which is a very, like a many, particularly those on the ground in Mississippi understand as a neo-Confederate state. Um, and so he wrote this piece uh, and I think the, the website is called Progressive Now. And uh, he, he is, is, it's entitled, Don't Just Fight, Build, right? And so he's suggesting that we're living within this, uh, this regime of whom Ronaldo Walcott called uh, yesterday President 45. Uh, and Akali is suggesting that, yes, so we're being, many of us, right, and the communities with which we work are being assaulted uh, from various angles and the desire is to run around and to defend ourselves and to fight back in different ways. Uh, and, but he's suggesting that, that now is a time in which we need to be, build alternative institutions. Like it's not enough to just think and to write, right? That is important. We need that process of sitting in critical, in critical study. 
but critical study is not necessarily going to change the world. Like, like we need praxis. Like we actually need to be creating these institutions, challenging ourselves to be uncomfortable, right? And to possibly move into the communities where we're doing work and not just going in there to do our scholar activism. Like those people are brilliant as fuck already. Like they know what's going on. They've been living it. You know, like we just extrapolate it and theorize it, but they already understand what's happening to them, what's been happening to them. And so I'm more so interested in pushing in the realm of building, like, okay, like we know what's going on, we've been knowing what's going on, but how can we begin to create these spaces, right? These kind of race spaces of respite, if you want to call them that, where in we could begin to think of another world and begin to build that other world, right? Um, and so I said I was going to be brief, and that is my, that's, that's me. Peace. Well, I just can't thank you enough. That, uh, even though it's completely unplanned, uh, that was the perfect way to, to end that set of, of panel remarks. And I